All right. We're going to talk about something that's not exactly dinner party conversation. Okay? But for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to talk about this very openly because it affects um, Parkinson's patients tremendously. And actually, you know, just as we get older. So everyone in this room, whether you have Parkinson's or not, okay, this is going to be very useful. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happens to a Parkinson's patient, but also give you some idea what you can do, even if you don't have Parkinson's, but similar symptoms. Um, I love doing this, okay? I love taking care of patients doing this, so I might foam at the mouth. So I just want to warn you, okay? You, you'll have time for questions later, but write, write them down as we go through. If you're dying to ask, just raise your hand, okay? I'll stop the talk, and you can ask the question. And finally, um, at least half of this is probably about treatment because I want to tell you what's out there, what kind of tricks we have up our sleeves, okay? So you don't have to suffer through this day in, day out, and during the night, as Dr. Glass alluded to. So you know this, I don't need to go through the statistics for you, but what about the bladder problems for Parkinson's? It's estimated up to 75% um, in, some, in some series of studies. And it generally comes on after the other symptoms, Okay, develop after the tremors and whatnot. So usually after you've been diagnosed. And of these, the majority tend to be what we call irritative symptoms. Okay, those are what we consider you have to go a lot. Frequency. There's that urge. You can't quite hold, hold it anymore. Okay, that urge may be leakage because you can't get there in time. And also waking up at night. Okay, we consider that all irritative symptoms. But, but some will also feel what we call obstructive symptoms. And that's, oh, there's some hesitancy. I gotta push a little and, and, and it comes and goes and I don't feel like I can get everything out even when I'm done, when the stream is finished. And then for most people actually, you know, a lot of patients I see, um, there's a little bit of both. So it's not really cut and dry. I should take someone to really think through your symptoms for you and help you, it's a partnership. It's very much a partnership when we are dealing with the bladder. It's what bothers you, what we need to do, okay, what's the pros and cons, and so forth. This is a little bit busy, but the key thing is that from all of our studies and from what we know, the most common is what we call the chooser overactivity. Okay, that's the frequency, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, went. You know, there's very little warning, very little time. That seems to be the majority um, of the problems that plague Parkinson's patients. But there's also another part where the bladder doesn't seem to squeeze as strongly. Okay, so it doesn't quite empty the urine out. So that's the bladder side. We also have a sphincter. That also plays into it. So everything's controlled by nerves, okay? And so the sphincter, the problem with the sphincter is that it's not as strong um, what it is is actually it's bradykinetic, actually. It's a little bit slow. So, you know, when you're supposed to pee, the bladder says, oh, I'm full, I gotta go. You know, the brain says, okay, hold on, hold on, you gotta get to the bathroom first, gotta get your pants down. So it's sending inhibition signals, okay, to control that. You gotta make sure there are no lions and tigers around, okay? And then it releases that inhibition signal, then your bladder, actually, then your sphincter relaxes first. Then your bladder squeezes, okay? So something we've taken for granted since you know, we were toilet trained, actually is a really complex and beautiful kind of neurophysiologic process. So as you can see, there's a lot of signaling going on. And all it takes is a little bit of a wire that's a little bit crossed, okay? And it just doesn't quite work perfectly. So, so the sphincter is a little slow. So it doesn't open as quickly when you need to urinate, okay? So all of those reflexes aren't quite there but it's also not super tight. And so sometimes when your bladder's going spasm and squeezing, you can leak. So what happens? So you can have incontinence. That's because the bladder is contracting, not really listening to you, not, not really listening to brain anymore. It's just going off whenever it wants to, okay? And also when your sphincter is a little slow or actually just not as strong, then it's easy to have leakage, okay? So that's one side of it. The other side is you don't quite get all the urine out. Maybe you're still holding 100 cc's or 200 cc's in your bladder when you're done. 
And that's because it's a damnest thing. So it spasms. It squeezes when you don't want it to squeeze. That's why you have to feel like you have to go all the time. But, but when it does squeeze, it doesn't give you a real good, strong squeeze. Okay, so you feel like you still have a little bit left. And because the sphincter is a bit stiff, it also doesn't relax completely for you to get all the urine out. Okay, so you feel that kind of, oh, it's coming, oh, I have to push. It doesn't quite flow as easily as it did before. This is where it gets a little bit um, confusing. And I'll mention a very briefly at the very end about for a lot of the gentlemen with prostate. When your prostate enlarges and blocks, you have very similar type of symptoms. Okay, and that's where you need a urologist to really tease this out for you. Okay, because when you have Parkinson's, dealing with BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, isn't so straightforward. There are a lot of things that you know, they need to counsel you and discuss and really figure out you know, all your symptoms. Can we blame it on the prostate? We usually do. We blame everything. And when a guy doesn't pee right, we always blame on the prostate first, okay? Because they have one and we don't. It's easy enough. But what I see is that a lot of gentlemen, whether they have Parkinson's or not, after they've got their rotor rooter job or the lasering nowadays, they still have bladder symptoms. So, so we need to think about the bladder and the prostate together. But, for, but this is what vexes a lot of um, people. You really need to tease out, okay, what to blame, so then you can target the treatment better. So these are the two main problems. Okay, for the bladder in Parkinson patients. You have an overactive bladder that causes leakage, and then you have some incomplete emptying. Okay, and so overactive bladder is actually the majority uh, that affects the majority of Parkinson's patients. So next 20 slides or so, I'm gonna talk about the overactive bladder. Okay, and this actually um, affects the entire population, but it seems to affect the Parkinson patient more severely and a younger age, okay? So this is the definition of overactive bladder. If you have any frequency, and by some definition that someone was doing studies on decided more than eight times in a day, with urgency, that you can't quite hold it for as long as you used to, with or without the leakage that comes with this urgency, and also nocturia. So any of those four things, all right, that's the symptomatic definition of overactive bladder. Just in general, it affects over 16, 17% of the population, about 33, 35 million adults. An interesting thing is, for men and women, it's actually equal. What's different, actually, in the general population is that more women tend to be wet. We tend to leak easier. And that goes into all the, you know, having had kids when you're younger, muscles being more lax after we go through menopause, things like that, okay? But as we all get older, over the next 10, 20 years, this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. And what we like to do is really try to bring this more out in the open, okay? It really, really affects people's health, people's kind of psychological state, and so it really ought to be talked about at dinner parties. <laughs> I'm not invited to very many dinner parties anymore. <laughs> So, <laughs> and you want to have an extra seating at Thanksgiving, you know, come talk to me afterwards. Quality of life, it sucks. Let's just, let's not mince any words. You know, they do all these studies, they look at people with diabetes, high blood pressure, depression. Depression is bad, obviously, you know. But overactive bladder, it's just a little bit above depression. It, and I think a lot of it's because it's not something we can talk about, right? You have cancer. I mean, people bring casseroles and, you know, they come visit you. You leak, so you go through a bag of Depends every day, you know? <laughs> you don't get a casserole. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's it, the martini. <laughs> Other issues. You avoid sexual intimacy. This is a really important part of life. Right? When you're 30, 60, 70, 90. I have a patient who is 90. I tell you, he's amazing. <laughs> he comes, gets his Viagra regularly. 60% <laughs> or more has associated depression. 
right? That's pretty logical, right? You don't need some scientific study to tell you that. But what's also worries me a lot is when I see patients, so the falls and the fractures, you can just see this scenario. Middle of the night, you have to get up three, four times, and that urge, you're trying to rush. It's dark, you trip on the rug, you break your hip, okay? As we get older, we don't do so well with broken hips, no matter how well the orthopedic surgeon can fix it, okay? So a lot of associated problems, and with leakage and hygiene, bladder infections also increase. And when your bladder doesn't squeeze quite as well, bladder infections also increase. So a lot of other issues that compound this, okay? And it's sad because a lot of patients don't seek help, whether you have Parkinson's or not. Multiple sclerosis patients have a lot of the same problems, okay? 73, 75% who seek treatment, they're not being treated. They're not on medication or anything or any other type of treatment. And they report, so 66 per two out of three report that symptoms affect their daily living. Some of them very, very severely. And what happens is it keeps them in the house, right? You become socially isolated. You don't go out as much. Or you figure out, you know every bathroom between the house and the shopping center. You know every bathroom in the shopping center. You know which hotels will let you go in and use their public bathroom. So people learn to compensate, right? And then you also start to reduce your fluids. Right? You figure out, God, if I don't drink, I don't have to pee as much. Okay? And now obviously you're spending money on the pads. Oh boy, that's a, it's a billion dollar industry. Okay? I just want to throw this in just to tell you, I keep talking about overactive bladder, and the leakage that comes from that is called urge incontinence, okay? Comes with an urge. There's another major type of incontinence that's stress incontinence, and that does tend to hit women more. But these are very different types of incontinence, and as we get older, they do tend to be mixed. You have a little bit of both. But the key is you st we still have to tease them out a little bit because the treatments for them are very different, okay? Beyond the conservative treatment that you can do with exercises, the more invasive treatments are very, very different. And so you can't just say, oh, I leak and think that one thing will work for the other, okay? So stress incontinence is when you leak, the moment you cough or laugh, you know, not because you're mentally stressed, but, you know, when you lift something and there's a whole spectrum of, what degree of stress incontinence. And um, this usually hits um, men if you've had some type of prostate surgery. The stress incontinence is usually associated with post-surgical. Okay, so that's overactive bladder. It's a whole mix, big mixing pot, okay? You have the stress, urinary incontinence, you have the urge, urinary incontinence, but then you have a mix for a lot of people, a little bit of both, okay? Um, so, so it takes a bit to really try to sort this out you know, before we start treatment. And then finally, the nocturia. Dr. Glass had mentioned this several times. Okay, waking up, you have to wake up to pee at night. Well, first of all, you have to figure out, is your bladder waking you up? Or are you awake already because you don't sleep well? And what the hell, right? When you wake up at night, what do you do? Go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, that's what we all do, right? So, and on top of it, as we get older, your kidneys don't concentrate as well. Okay, when you were in your 30s, your kidneys actually only made about 25% of the amount of urine that you made during the whole day. That's because you have to get through sleep. Your bladder can only hold so much. If it's still making a liter, liter and a half, of course you're going to have to wake up at night. So it concentrates for nighttime. But as we get older, that ability decreases. So you start making actually larger volumes of urine. Okay? Also depends on, you know, the fluid that you drink, um, medications. Of course, right? So don't take your um, water pills, your diuretics, late in the afternoon or at night. Okay? Sometimes it's just very simple things. But nocturia is a whole different animal. Okay? If that's the only thing that bothers you, then we need to look at all of these to try to sort that out again. Okay?